All right, welcome to week 10. Um, lab nine has some interesting quirks as some of you have discovered. Uh, there's a spot that says you're gonna get two error messages. A lot of people are getting one. Uh, essentially, if you get one error message and you fix your problem, congrats, it worked. Uh, there used to always be consistently two error messages and then somewhere along the way, the second error message went away on Windows, but it was still there on Mac. Sometimes it's there on Mac, sometimes it's not. So if you fixed it and you were able to get a backup, congrats. Good enough. Uh, don't panic if there's not two error messages. So that having gotten out of the way, we're going to talk about uh, this week's lab, I mean lecture, and then I'll mention a few things about the lab. Specifically, we're focusing on uh, database security. And first, I'm going to talk about the principles of it and then things that apply specifically to MySQL. Okay, so the, one of the important topics that not a lot of people talk about, unless you're taking a dedicated course, is what happens when there's database failure, security failure. Um, this means when a database is compromised, it usually ends up with a few of the following results. Uh, there's a breach, data is stolen or there's data loss where the data is destroyed, or the worst case scenario, both. I'm sure most of you have read something about a data breach in the last year. There's only been a few. And by a few, I'm like there's been one a week practically. Whether it's a gaming company getting their source code stolen, <clears throat> Rockstar, um, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or, you know, over a few last couple of years, getting their data stolen. Uh, there's a pharmaceutical company in the U.S. recently that had their entire customer list leaked. Um, or um, when one of the credit checking companies in the U.S. got leaked. Um, th those things are really bad. Just just so you know, you don't want your data to go away. Um, so then we got ourselves a wall of text. So there's a few damages when there's a security failure. Um, there's a loss of intellectual property. Having private data be leaked can be a really bad thing. Uh, for example, when Equifax got leaked in the States, they had you know, social security numbers and social insurance numbers basically leaked to the internet. And what happens in Canada, if somebody has your SIN number, they get to be you for the day. And there's no proof that it's not you because our SIN cards don't have photos with them which if you think about it is a really stupid idea to not have photos on your SIN card. Um, amongst other things, people can also get copies of source code and discover vulnerabilities in people's software uh, that might not get patched, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there could be damage to corporate image and reputation. As purchasers, we tend to look around at who's reputable or not. And if you find out that the company you're planning to you know, give your money to is not very good at keeping your, their stuff safe, you might want to shop elsewhere. Um, business continuity. Somebody, you know, gets a hold of your database server and wipes your database. If you don't have a proper backup, like we talked about last week, it has happened where data breaches have literally killed companies. Company exists one day, they fire the wrong person, the person goes and erases the servers as their last act as they're walked out the door. Company comes back the next day and discovers that they don't have any source code anymore and there's no way to get it back. It has happened. Um, it Yes, it has killed companies. Um, penalties for non-compliance, this one's fun. Um, so there's tons of global regulations and if your data gets breached, that means you weren't following the rules. And not only are you going to have a loss of image and have to apologize and potentially, you know, pay damages, uh, you may also have, um, you might be fined by certain uh, corporations or organizations. Uh, there's Sourcebanes Oxley, which is a big one in the U.S. That has to do with financial transactions and proving that you're not cooking the books. Um, this came... Uh, that, that particular legislation came in place after uh, and the Enron fiasco in the U.S. Uh, most of you are probably too young to remember Enron, or not too young, but you were young enough that you didn't care what was happening. 
but essentially, um, they were faking all their financials. A bit like what Nortel is doing here in Ottawa, where they basically faked five years worth of financials just to make it look like they were doing better than they were. Um, PCI DSS. Now, for those of you that don't know what PCI DSS is, How many of you have one of these? It's a credit card. PCI DSS is the regulations that govern using credit cards online. There is a lot of rules when you're using a credit card online. Um, you might not think of it, but there's things such as rules along lines of an employee that walks into, sorry, a visitor to your building must be signed in, escorted, and wear a badge if anywhere in your building a credit card is processed. Rules are like that. So if your database full of credit cards gets compromised, the people behind PCI DSS will come around with a big fat fine and revoke your status. And you have to go through the whole process all over again. Uh, the place I was working at, uh, we went through PCI DSS 10 years ago and it cost us $75,000 just to get certified. And we weren't even handling the cards in house. <laughs> that was just because we had an e-commerce site. Uh, that we were running ourselves, not through like a third-party platform like Shopify or eBay. Um, HIPAA, uh, we have something equivalent in Canada. I don't remember what it's called. That's the American Protections for Health inf health, in health Information, patient data from hospitals. Uh, your patient data goes out, places in, you know, a violation of HIPAA, and away you go. And GDPR, uh, that's a big one that we should all care about. Uh, the European Union put in big heavy-duty rules about your rights of your data online and California's following suit and a few of other American states. And I'm sure Canada eventually will get around to it. Um, essentially it says that if somebody says to delete the data, you have to get rid of it unless it has to do with financial transactions. And even then you have to be able to isolate it to just whatever they gave you money. Anything else has to be deleted. If you don't, um, the first finds 10,000, the second finds 50,000 euros, the next finds 100,000. And then it starts jumping very quickly into the tens of millions. Uh, they will basically give you two kicks of the can and then they're going to bankrupt you, which is cool. And then you're allowed to get sued by the person individually also. So you got to be careful with that. Um, and then Recovery and damage mitigation costs. If anybody here has ever had a car that broke down, you know fixing stuff costs a lot of money. And fixing the date for a corporation costs a lot of money. And by a lot, I mean a lot. Not only are you talking about storage costs, you're talking about labor, uh, what they call lost opportunity. In other words, while your systems are down, you can't sell. That means anything you would have sold during that period is now gone also, so you're losing profit, you're losing everything. So, a security breach is actually a big deal. All right, so what are some common threats? Insider threats. That's actually one of the biggest sources of um, data loss. A malicious employee, person leaves. As they leave, they go and nuke the database uh, or the server or whatever. Um, negligence. Um, Debbie, the receptionist has her password written on the, on the side of her screen, stuck to a post-it note because she can't remember her password, but just so happens that she's able to enter payments on invoices. She could theoretically allow someone to access the accounting system because she's not being careful. And this one actually happens more than people think, um, corporate spies, infiltrators. Um, people that are like basically working for two different companies at the same time. It sounds like a uh, plot for a really bad movie, but it's actually a lot more common than you think it is, um, especially in the big corporations. Um, that actually happened a lot, like for example, to Nortel. It's a good example of what happened. Um, there was people that were literally hired that were on another company's payroll and their job was to steal their IP. Hmm. Huawei is a good example of people that were paying them to take their tech. Um, it is what it is. 
Human error. The meat sack at the chair is always the weakest link. People that write passwords on post-it notes. Uh, people that don't understand that nobody should ever ask you for a password. And if someone does, you should not answer them. Um, to give you an idea how bad people are with passwords. When I was in college, I did my co-op at a fairly large corporation. Um, like, I think they had several thousand employees worldwide. So it wasn't tiny. And the head of IT said he wants to test people's ability to understand security risks. So he gave me everybody's extensions and then sent me home to call them and see how many passwords I could get through social engineering. I was able to get 95% of people's passwords by picking up the phone and calling them. And then we did, it, we did it a month later and went down to 45%. I'm thinking a lot of people had a really serious conversation with their managers. The human factor is always the most dangerous one. You can't, you can really do nothing about that. So you got to make sure all your other stuff's, you know, in place. Uh, injection attacks. Um, that's when somebody figures out a way to inject SQL code into their form submissions and you didn't do, or someone didn't do a good job making sure the strings are sanitized. Uh, malware. Somebody opens up an extension, an, an attachment. It's over. Um, sometimes it attacks on people's backups. So not only do they attack the servers, the, you know, malicious employee may also attack the backup server so they can really take you out. So that being said, now that we know all the risks and we know, you know, who causes these problems and all that fun stuff, what can we do to secure a database? This actually basically applies to servers in general, not necessarily just databases, because really you should be taking pretty much the same steps with your web servers and your application servers. Uh, but since it's a database course, we're going to focus on the database. So when you're securing the database, the first step is physical access. You want to disable as much physical access as humanly possible. You don't let people into the room where the server is stored. End of story. Administrative and network access. Maybe access to the server should only be limited to specific people. And from specific locations. You don't want your database server open to the world. Yeah, I love the air conditioning, eh? That's what it is. It's the it's the the vents. No, it's the vents. All right. User accounts. Um, we want to have a bare minimum number of user accounts. We want to secure them for as best as possible. If somebody leaves, you nuke their accounts. You nuke their accounts before you tell them they're leaving. Uh, if somebody is quitting, there should be a policy in place that. You know, the second you find out the person is quitting, their account gets killed within minutes. Um, just saying. I've been on the I've been on the IT side where somebody was being walked into the boardroom, and I was sent an email saying kill this account at two o'clock, and then I watched them walk by at two o five to the boardroom. So you know, um, user accounts are important. Service isolation. Uh, that usually means you want to keep your servers isolated from each other as much as possible. In other words, don't have everything running on one server if you can avoid it. Because if that server gets compromised, they got the keys to the kingdom. Realistically, it's just a web server and they figure out a way to get access to the SSH shell on your web server. And your database happens to be running there too. Okay, well, they got access to everything. So service isolation means you separate the pieces as much as possible. Instead of buying one really big expensive server, buy a bunch of cheap shitty servers and just spread the load across them. It'll also give you some redundancy if, in case something goes horribly wrong. Okay, physical security. Database servers should be held in a secure environment. Physical access should be restricted to the bare minimum number of users. Um, last place I was at, there was only three of us that could get into the server room. 
if somebody else needed to the server room, the question was, why do you need in there? And they usually the answer was, no, I don't care. You're not getting in there. Um, usually, if we had a contractor coming in, we had one of the three of us standing in the room with them while they did whatever they were doing in there. So, I mean, like, an electrician was coming in to run new runs or whatever. We were standing in there with them. Uh, usually, you have a key card and a passkey of some sort that's that keeps the door locked. Um, tap access only. Um, any access to the server room should be logged. So if somebody taps in, you know they came in. And by rule, they should be required to tap out so you know when they left. Um, that one's a little harder to enforce. And one of the perks of moving everything into the cloud is your employees don't have physical access to those servers. Even at places like Amazon, the number of people that can walk into the data center and actually touch one of the servers on the rack, very small number of people. Uh, none of the servers have screens. None of them have keyboards. So even if they touch the server, the best they can do is pull out the drives. And considering the fact that most Amazon servers don't even have drives in them, yeah, no, it's pretty hard to just pull a drive. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen one of the um, documentaries that covers how stuff like that in those data centers work. Let's say they need to maintain a physical server. They have to tap into the building tap into the server room, tap onto the rack to unlock the rack, then tap the server to unlock the server. So they literally have a complete trail of who touched what. Unless they stole the person's card, but even then that's, you know, iffy. Um, it costs you a little more to have it up at AWS or Azure or Rackspace or whatever you're using, but at least, if nothing else, you know, nobody can take and physically touch your server, and that's a good thing. There's nothing quite like a good cup of coffee or a, a rare earth magnet to make everybody's life unpleasant. And I've seen both of those. There's a reason I picked that example. Uh, we had a um, contractor who's running electrical, came in with his Tim Horns coffee, put it on top of the server rack while he's working, he elbowed it into the rack. Um, and then we had another one who thought he was funny because he, he put a big sticker on the front of the server, like a big uh, note, do not touch, but it was like a really powerful magnet and he screwed up one of the drives. So, you know, again, the meat sack. Administrative security. <clears throat> Limit the number of super users. Realistically, there should only ever be one super user and nobody should be able to use it. Like, how many of you have installed Ubuntu? How many of you notice it never asks you to set your root password? You can't set your root password because by default, the root root, root cannot log in. You actually have to go out of your way to enable root login. Everything else is run as sudo, and the fact you run things as sudo is logged. So, you know, you have super users. You just don't enable them if you can. Um, administrative accounts should be as limited as possible. Even if you have an admin account, maybe don't give them the keys to the uh, kingdom. Like, don't let them create new users, except for maybe one or two. Um, that kind of stuff. So, you should also use modern security methods, such as a strong password. And we know how well that works. It doesn't. Um, SSL keys are a much better way of doing things. You have a file, and when you go to connect, the file has to exist. If it doesn't exist, you can't connect. Each person should have their own SSL keys. Uh, using encryption for the for the connections. For example, MySQL 8 requires encryption now when you connect. Even when you do the command line one, it's actually encrypting the connection to the server. Um, and there's other things I've seen. Um, authentication apps and smart cards. So you go to log in, it asks you to punch in a number. Most of you probably have experienced MFA before. That's another form of security or the smart card. Uh, like my daughter at her job, she can't even turn on the laptop unless her smart card's plugged in it. Like you turn it on and it just says insert smart card. She can't even get past the BIOS because her laptop's completely encrypted. Cool stuff. Um, it's really nifty. Her actual ID badge plugs into the side of her computer. So. 
audit where administrators log in from. So if somebody logs in with an administrative account, that should be logged as to where are they connecting from. <laughs> if the database is in Ottawa and they're con connecting from Kazakhstan, good chance it's not your, it's not the correct uh, person connecting. Unless, you know, your administrator's on vacation in Kazakhstan, but, you know, I'm just saying, the odds are that's not good. Um, so you just want to keep track of where things are coming from. User security. So once you start exper experiencing computing a bit more, you'll discover that certain kinds of applications only have a single user. You install a web app. For example, WordPress. WordPress asks you for two accounts not counting the actual administrative account. It asks you for an account that can create the database and an account that can create the tables. And it'll create the database and a user and then switch everything to use the limited user. So an application account should only be able to do the bare minimum required for that application. If it doesn't need to create tables, delete, drop tables, that kind of stuff, then don't let that account be able to do that. Restrict the number of interactive user permissions. This is the same thing. So for example, you have 20 developers on your team. They're connected to the dev server. Maybe you don't want to give them rights to create other users or to grant privileges, that kind of thing. Um, you should audit user account regularly. And once in a while, go through the users, see whose accounts exist and compare them to who's actually supposed to be able to connect. and keep it pruned. Um, and audit user access regularly. Again, just checking the logs, make sure nobody's connecting from, you know, somewhere they're not supposed to be connecting from. Database in Ottawa, connecting from Columbia. Maybe they're on vacation. Maybe they're not. You know, uh, you just got to keep track of where people are connecting from. All right, service isolation. This might come as a shock. Run it behind a firewall. Don't have it sitting connected to the internet, open to the internet. Um, I think I don't really need to explain why you don't want your database server connected directly to the internet. Uh, but just so that for those of you that don't get it, there's bad people out there that want to do bad things to you. Okay? Separate your database from your application server. At least if one gets compromised, the other might not. And the last one is just a repeat of the first one. Never have it connected directly to the internet. Um, how many of you have ever heard about the, um, the the hacker contests where they put three computers on a network and the first person to compromise each of the machines wins a prize? Linux, the last time I saw it, Linux took 14 minutes uh, to be compromised. Windows took seven minutes, Mac OS took 14 seconds. Because apparently, because you have a Mac, it means it's safe. Um, no, it's not. It's just nobody uses it for high security environments. So they've never hardened it. Database servers are just yet another vector for someone to get through. If they can connect to the port, they can probably crash it and get access to your system. Just don't connect it to the internet. All right, now, Users and privileges. A user or process should have the lowest level of privilege required to perform his or her or their assigned task. Limiting access to the lowest possible level required to work, that's what it means, least privilege. So for example, you have a user that connects and their job is to um, read the logs and the log entries in one of the tables. They have, they shouldn't be able to see anything else. In theory, you can give them permissions to read from that table and nothing else. They try to do anything else and just gives them errors. You just don't want to let people run free with, with side your stuff. Okay, so there's a couple of different kinds of uh, privileges in a database server. There's admin privileges. So that's providing access to actually manage the server. It should be really limited and only give it to those that really need it. Um, 
you don't want to let your um, intern have access to the admin. Um, heck, man, you shouldn't let the admin have access to the admin, but you do have to trust someone eventually. As a person, like I said before, I've truncated a table by accident because I wasn't paying attention and I did not have enough coffee in my system. I should not. That day, I really should have revoked my own privileges. Um, but, you know, being the only database admin, it is what it is. Um, so really, it should only be granted. It should be logged. You only give them to who actually needs it. Any given corporation should only ever have one or two super level admin type users. Um, usually the one that does the job and a backup or, you know, a small team of two to four people. Uh, the managers, for example, should never have those rights. The interns definitely should never have those rights. Um, database privileges. There's a level below admin. Admin allows you to turn the server on and off allows you to create new users, that kind of thing. There's database privileges, which allow you to actually modify the structure of the database, including creating new databases, dropping said databases. Um, you can probably guess that's not a good thing to give everybody. And then there's object level privileges. So this is inside a given database, you can tell the people they can have access to the tables, the views, indexes, those kinds of things. Um, so user administration, user access can be controlled. Normally when the user is created, you can alter them later, but at first you will create a user that has a limited set of privileges. Different database servers do this slightly differently. So MySQL is one of the few things MySQL does well. And I'll put it out here now. It's one of the few times you'll ever hear me compliment MySQL. So MySQL allows you to restrict a user to log in by IP address. I mean, you can do it in Oracle, you can do it in Postgres and that kind of thing. But the way MySQL does it is a little different. It does it as records inside its own self. So there's a database inside MySQL that, that tells it these users are allowed to connect from these addresses. Postgres, you do it by using a file on the disk. Oracle, it's it's wizardry. You sacrifice a chicken, you pour the blood on the computer, and you know magically nobody can log in. Microsoft SQL Server, it does it in the database, more or less, kind of. Um, but what's, so we can say, hey, user ABC can only connect from 192.168.16, 25. ABC tries to connect from anywhere else. The server says, nah, dude, you can't. As those of you that have started doing the backup lab have experienced when you try to run a, the, you know, the MySQL dump command and you don't, you're not providing the right credentials, it gives you an error message, right? You get something similar except saying you're not allowed to log in from set a certain address. So when a user is created, by default, they have no privileges at all. It's a blank slate. The user exists. The user can connect. Nothing else. So picture it like this, where somebody gives you a key to their front door. You're able to put the key in the door, turn the key, and open the door. But once you step in, there is a void. You cannot see anything. You cannot touch anything. You can go nowhere except leave. That's essentially the situation a new user finds themselves in. So the syntax is specifically for MySQL, create user, the username at the host, identified by a password. There's actually a whole pile of um, other parameters, but 95% of the time, this is what you need in MySQL. So, a MySQL username is 16 characters max. Cool. Host. The host can be local host. Can be an address, an IP address, <coughs> or a wildcard. Now, you have to be careful because certain computers are a little weird. And 
when you connect from the command prompt, instead of saying localhost, it'll go 127001, which is localhost. However, with MySQL, if you don't specify 127001 and you only specify localhost, it's going to say, nah, bro, you're not allowed to connect. It's that picky. Um, and the other thing is on Windows, especially like Windows 11, when you go to connect locally, sometimes they'll do the IPv6 version, which is like colon colon one. So you actually have to define all three for a user and you actually have to do the create user command three times. So you can turn off IPv6 for MySQL. That's like usually the first thing I recommend. Uh, it'll save you all kinds of grief. So the wildcard, you have a few choices. Percent sign. So if you just go at quote percent quote means this user is allowed to connect from anywhere. And or you can use the percent sign inside the, uh, the IP address itself. So 192.168.1.% That's basically saying anybody can connect as long as they're on their 192.168.1 subnet. In most companies, they'll use the 10 set or the 192 set. And I've seen the 81 set for some unknown reason. Um, and essentially, if you're not on that subnet, you can't connect. That means you have to be on the local network to connect to the server. Um, if you remember your SQL class last semester, what's the wildcard character for like? Percent. They're using the same thing. So if you remember one, you'll remember this one. If you want to change a person's password, this slide actually used to have a lot more information on it because it included the instructions for MySQL 5.7. Nobody's running 5.7. So alter user, username at host, identified by whatever password. Now, here's what's nifty. Why earlier I said it's the only time I'll give MySQL a compliment. You can actually have different passwords depending on where you're connecting from. Most of you probably hadn't clued into that thought. So you could go root at localhost identified by one, two, three, four, five, six. That means that they're physically sitting connected to the server at the keyboard. If they got access to the keyboard, there's probably not a whole lot you can do to stop the security at that point anyway. So who cares? On the other hand, if they're connecting from 192.168.16 wildcard, maybe you want them to have a different password for that so that, you know, the local access is different than access over the network. So MySQL lets you have different passwords for the same user, depending where they're connecting from. It's a cool trick. Um, that is definitely not something I've seen in any other database server. Is it a good feature? Maybe. It's cool. I don't know if it's a good feature, but it's a cool feature. So drop user. You remove the user and their respective privileges. Drop user, if exists, right? Username. For example, drop user Lisa at localhost. So you could say, hey, root's not allowed to connect from anywhere else but localhost now. So you could drop root everywhere else. But you have to drop them each entry one at a time. Uh, if you just go with drop user root, it'll get rid of the root user completely. And they're probably not going to have a good time after that. Okay. So this is how you add a user, change their password, and get rid of them. There's a little more to use security than that. There's two more commands, grant and revoke. Grant lets you... Uh, grant user privileges. Revoke means you take away their privileges. And these are the basic ones, basically all servers support. Well, except the last one, all. That means you're granting the user all privileges. So they're allowed to do everything. But it's granted on a specific database. Unless you tell it grant privileges to everything, it's only on a specific database. Uh, grant select, that means they have read only. Insert, delete, update. Guess what? Now they can insert, update, delete data. Yeah, then you can create, grant, create, alter, or drop, which means now they can actually change the structure of the database. If you give them usage, it means, so that's the default privilege they get. When you create a user, they get 
usage. In other words, they can unlock and open the door, but they can't do anything inside. They can just connect. Um, so the syntax is as follows. Grab the like, grant privileges. And um, there's an option for columns, which is interesting. Um, I'll get to that in a second. On a given object to a user, and at this point in theory, you could actually give them a new password. So the user can connect with password one to the server, but if they want to do stuff, they have to actually provide a second password. Extra tight security. Uh, with grant option. Okay, that one's really freaking dangerous. So an example is to be grant all on dbmusic.star to db user identify by user pass. Okay. Theoretically, you don't need the identified by user pass. You could just drop that if you wanted, if you're giving it to an existing user with existing privileges. So what that command is saying, saying we're going to give all rights on a database called dbmusic to all objects therein contained. So in theory, inside DB Music, if you have multiple tables, you can actually just grant privileges to one or two tables. Or you can grant to star, which is everything in there. You can go grant all on star.star, .star, which means that user has unrestricted access to the whole server. That idea. Just, just saying. You just don't want to do that. Um, so the last one at the end is with grant option. If you provide someone with grant option, they'll be able to give the same permissions they have to anybody else that already exists in the system. So you got, you know, Frank has lots of privileges. Bob has barely, barely any privileges. Bob is getting an issue trying to do his work. He's like, oh, I keep getting an error. He asks Frank, what's wrong? You're like, oh, you don't have enough privileges. Give me a second. Then, you know, Frank could grant privileges to Bob. Again, probably not something you want to let people do unless they know what they're doing. Rev it's literally the opposite. Like, you grant all, you could go revoke all on dbmusic.star from whatever user. You don't need to worry about a password because you're taking away rights. And you can revoke all privileges by going revoke all privileges come a grant option from whatever user this happens to be. That means that you are yoinking all their permissions. They will never allow you to be doing anything on that database ever again, unless you give it back to them. You're taking away their ability to work. Um, if you want to know what a person can do, in MySQL, the command is called show grants. So show grants for, give it a username, and it'll show you all the privileges they have pretty straightforward. Uh, it just literally outputs a list of privileges a person has. And this is also a MySQL, very MySQL specific thing. The other ones have been generic, like each database server will have its own flavor of those commands. Like they're going to be close, not completely the same, but close. Flush is a MySQL specific one. So MySQL caches security. Server boots, MySQL starts up, the service starts up, it reads all the privileges and stores them in memory. You grant new privileges to someone, it, they don't take effect right away till you issue a flush privileges command. Then what it does is it goes, hey, MySQL, we just changed our permissions. Maybe you should be paying attention to the fact that they changed. So what it does is it builds up the new sets of privileges, drops them from memory, and copies the new ones in memory. So then your users will now have up to privileges. Good chance the user itself themselves have to disconnect and reconnect so that everything kicks in. But flush privileges is what you're after. Okay, so now I'm going to launch my SQL Workbench real quick. Because I've had a few cases where people ask me questions. And man, I hope the Mac users don't have problems with this. Okay. Connecting to my local instance. And so some of what 
they're asking you guys to do will be under uh, server users and privileges. It'll give you this tab. Um, in here, it'll get you to add an account. You give some users, you set your host, you set a password, you know, this and the password is super secure. Yeah, I know it's a weak password. And I hit apply. So my user exists. And it talks about administrative roles. This is a MySQL Workbench thing. MySQL Workbench has built in roles that you can use that default certain features. For example, ADBA has, if you watch the privileges on the side, you'll see them change because they have access to everything. Uh, maybe they're a database designer, so they only need this set of privileges, or they're a manager, so they need that. Or um, they, they're a monitor, so all they need to be able to do is see pro processes. So depending on which combination of things you pick, it changes the privileges on the side. The lab is making you pick a few of these and apply them to a user you're creating. Uh, the other part where people have a challenge with this is the, the labs say, hey, create a new connection. What we mean by that is literally you're going to hit the plus sign, leave that as that, connection literally it's creating another so when then what you do is you double connect it as example user if i double click, you can see they're separate users and they actually see the user i just created doesn't have any privileges so he can't see the schema this user is a root user it can see the schema so part of the lab is saying hey what can they use what can they see what they cannot see that kind of thing it's not a hard lab you just got to actually you know pay attention to what it tells you to do I'm hoping, like I said, I hope the Mac users don't have a hard time with this because, you know, they've already had a hard time with the design tool where their icons aren't there or the design tool doesn't launch at all. So here's the hoping. Um, I'm not going through the lab itself because, well, I'd be doing the lab for you guys and I'm recording this. Uh, but uh, realistically, that was like a quarter of the lab I just showed you. So. It's not a complicated lab. All right. So does anybody have any questions about uh, the topic of the day? Any curiosities or, you know? No? Absolutely. Did that by accident once. So for those of you that might be watching the recording and that aren't here, somebody just asked me, can you remove the privileges of the root user? Yes. Yes, you can. You can delete the root user. And guess what just happened? You have lost access to your database and your data. Um, a reinstall will probably not do anything. MySQL stores files um, in an interesting way. I'm running a different version of uh, MySQL here, but uh, Now, these are the logs. I'm trying to remember where the heck it stores the files under sys. No. Um, somewhere in here, it perform, it, it holds the databases. Um, I'm just not sure exactly where off the top of my head anymore. Really thought that's where it was. Sure. No. It's somewhere in here. Uh, probably if I launched my SQL admin, uh, I mean, my web server and did some changes, I'd find the files. But yeah. Essentially, you can't tell what the files actually look like. I could have sworn they were in here. Um, oh, hang on. Let me go look. Uh, no, no, not here. There it is. So you can see the databases. 
that I have it on my server right now. You can see flight DB inventory, order sample, Kila, sys. In theory, you would uninstall everything, recreate, reinstall the server, and potentially create a new database, and then turn off the server and copy the files for your old database in, and you might bring it back. Might is the operative word. So yeah, don't delete your root user. That's a long story short. Don't delete your root user because you're not going to have a good time. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, going three times. Good. Um, final exam schedules are out. Check it on Axis. If I remember right, it's on the Tuesday at 6.30 at night. Um, for those of you that don't know what 6.30 means, it's 18.30. Uh, and um, it's going to be as far as, if I remember in B307, so that's the lecture hall in B on the third floor. So, in that really loud area. If you haven't been in that lecture hall, you're about to experience it. All right. That's it for today. Have a nice evening, folks.